details promptly. So I've just made sure that is the case. We'll see a few more people uh, joining now. Um, I'm going to kick things off though, because I know people always, it populates around about 30, 40 by about 10 past. So I'll kick things off so we don't lose any time. Uh, I'm delighted to have here today, uh, Chris Williamson of Western Williamson and Partners, who's gonna be talking about uh, the future of city mobility and the architect's role in this. The CPD will be, CPD will be about the work of Western Williamson past and present, uh, explaining the practices role in creating civilized cities and transport's role within that. Uh, the talk will include uh, Western Williamson and Partners work on the Jubilee Line on Crossrail and how this work has led to establishing studios in Sydney, Melbourne and Toronto. Um, Chris will also describe the studio culture um, and the 20 year vision of his practice. For those of you who are new to CPDs and hopefully some of you are becoming regular visitors now, um, we try to give discussion and Q&A equal billing to the talk itself, whereby the talk will last for roughly 30 minutes, maybe a bit more. And then we will open the floor to discussion and questions uh, you will have for Chris as well. Um, you can put questions in the chat. Um, I can read them out. Or maybe if you, if you feel confident, you can unmute yourself as well. Um, and then after that, hopefully we'll yeah, have a nice flowing conversation. But without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Chris take the floor. Thank you, Chris, by the way. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation and thanks for joining. Um, I've always been fascinated by visions of the future. I was 12 years old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And I think from that time, always been, well, before that probably, fascinated by the future. And the next 20, 30 years are going to be even more fascinating. When you imagine the aid in technology in the way that we work and, and, and put that forward to how we're going to travel in the future between and thirties. And in some ways, this is a lesson of how not to think because these, these images show us what we can imagine but they don't actually teach us what we ought to be doing. So when I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking about the future, but also the relevance of the past. So I want to talk about the vision for the future of transport, but also what we've learned from what we've been doing, both in the immediate past and for centuries before that. Because um, these are all fascinating images, again, from the 30s. And when you see these, you can imagine how relevant in some ways they are to a post-pandemic uh, city. But then there's, a, there's another level. I, I chaired recently a seminar on the future of transport with engineers, uh, providers, uh, futurists, and product designers. And, uh, one of, the, one of the most uh, notable uh, contributors, um, Glenn Lyons from, from Mott MacDonald, a professor at the University of, of, of the East, said, we're very, so all those images show what is possible, but they don't really show why we ought to be doing it. This is, uh, I've just finished a film on, on London Bridge and on the effect of cities coming, uh, railways coming into the city. So I think there's a lot we can learn from the past. So our first experience really of designing transport for cities was the Jubilee Line station at London Bridge. And what that did was give us great experience in designing all sorts of things, refurbishing these magnificent brick arches, uh, Victorian brick arches, but also product design, uh, the services boom, the cladding panels, which we wanted to think about in terms of the Victorian engineers and what they would be doing with the materials and techniques we, we had available to us. Uh, 
how all the products went together, the seats, the lighting, the services boom, uh, the signage. Um, it was a great experience uh, to work on it and a really interesting project. It was for us early on in our careers, like doing five projects in one, and it really gave us a, a great experience of different kinds of work. But more relevant than, than that was the realization of how we could use that experience to shape the city. So the, the Jubilee line, the, the cost was a lot, it was three and a half billion, but, it, but the, in terms of the effect that it had on the city and the regeneration and the redevelopment of the whole of the East End of London is transformational. So that gave us a really impetus to make this kind of work the, the focus of the practice. And when we were at university, Andrew and I were experienced what was the first energy crisis, uh, which was caused, caught, brought about by the Saudi Arabia oil, the, the cartel, and the realization that energy was a finite resource and we had to look after it. And since then, I think we've all become to realize how, how these decisions of how we travel, how we consume, have, have it on the earth um, and the resources. Sorry, this isn't see. So, and also what we're doing to our planet by the kind of development that we've been um, associated with. So building more and more roads um, has had a, a really, detrimental effect on the way that we live and the kind of environments that we're creating for ourselves. And the effect that has on our physical and mental health. So since doing the Jubilee Line project, we've been fortunate to work on projects like Crossrail, High Speed 2, lots of projects for the Docklands Light Railway and for London Underground. And we're really proud of that contribution of, of looking at how London has transformed itself into a more civilized city, investing in public transport um, rather than letting everybody just get into their, their cars. So we've been fortunate to work in other places in the world um, where they they're doing the same thing now. So in Melbourne, we're working on the Melbourne Metro which is trying to get people out of their cars onto a good, efficient public transport system. And the same in Sydney um, and then Singapore and other places that we've been fortunate to work. Um, sorry, Frankie, can I just probably repeat by mistake going into the, the, the right hand. So, so this is the start of our work for Crossrail, where we worked on the on Whitechapel station. And then following on that on from that, we've been working on uh, Paddington. I just want to flip through these quickly because we, we, we haven't got that much time uh, to talk about our projects uh, before we, we get on to the, 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 the real future of, of transport. But I think it's so. What, what these projects have, have taught us is how people travel, how people, what the, the, what the effect of, of, of these developments, these infrastructure developments have been on the city, uh, working with artists uh, to make them more attractive and working on the learning from the Victorian engineers. So Paddington Station, was built by uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, designed as an engineer, but he also worked with Digby Wyatt um, on the architecture and the decoration, and Owen Jones. So there's artists, architects, and engineers working on the same project. So these are things that we're trying to incorporate into our current and future projects. 
Um, and the scale of these projects are amazing. This, the, 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 the platforms underneath Eastbourne Terrace in Paddington are 240 meters long. So these, these huge boxes underneath the, the road and they're, they're fantastic spaces, but they're also transformational spaces creating new public space. So this used to be Departures Road where the taxis uh, picked people up. We've moved the taxis to the north of the station as part of the development uh, of Paddington Basin. So using this as a new public space, so people come out of the Brunel uh, mainline train station into what used to be Departures Road and then down into the, the box for the crossrail. So the moment you start, the moment you step off the train, you can see the canopy above, and that that guides your journey in in a very simple way. There's a clear direction of travel, and then so this canopy on the on the side of the Brunel shed is the size, the length of a football pitch, um, and we've incorporated an artwork into it, and that that really guides the whole of the circulation for Crossrail and the whole of the, the route. So this is Spencer Finch, who designed the Cloudscape, uh, which is incorporated into the glass of Paddington Station. Um, and again, looking at the effect of Crossrail, yes, it's expensive and unfortunately it's late, uh, but when I was making the film uh, on the, coming, the railways coming into London and, and uh, looking at the effect of, of that development in the, uh, from 1836 to 1886, that 50 year period, um, the projects were, had similar problems. Um, and I, so learning from history, um, we can tell that the, there are complicated projects, that they always that, that there are always issues with them. But the effect on the development of the city is immense. And that's the thing that I would like to focus on today. So this is Woolwich Station. So we, we're doing Paddington Station at the west of the city and uh, Woolwich Station to the east. And at Woolwich, there wasn't going to be a crossrail station until the developer, Barclay Homes, and the local council got together and petitioned Parliament and proved to them what a, what a new station, a new crossrail station would do for the redevelopment opportunities for the local neighbourhood. And so these infrastructure projects are really changing the nature of the growth of the city. There's a, demand, a conventional demand model, which everything is centred uh, towards the city and the West End. But then when you factor in Crossrail and developments like the Bakerloo Line Extension and the Northern Line Extension and Crossrail 2, which will hopefully run north-south, that really affects the way that the city works. And London becomes again a true polycentric city, uh, which it used to be. We were part of old uh, villages turning into towns uh, turning into the city we now call London. And now the new transport systems will give people choice of where to live and work um, and take out that uh, people coming into the city and coming into the West End, um, giving them choice of where to live and work. And on a more, you can see that on a more modest scale as well, the East London line, uh, this is Dalston Station, very modest station, but there are 2,000 new homes and a new community um, around the station. Um, and that's, that's, that's affected the whole of the, the east end of London um, and development along the Kingsland Road of people um, living and working. In, in that new community. So projects that we're working on like Crossrail 2, uh, the North-South link, there are obviously development opportunities at Tottenham Court Road and Victoria, but to us, the, the more important ones are the ones further out, places like Enfield, where there are 
great opportunities for um, redeveloping communities, uh, establishing new communities next to new uh, railway stations and expanding the, the, the choice of where people live and work. So the, there were five stations al along that corridor uh, with great opportunities to reorganize and add to and create, create communities. So a couple of years ago, I think it was, I, I wrote this article, uh, which was actually for, for Jason's uh, magazine, for, the, for Citizen, uh, which is a, was a great magazine, by the way, um, looking at the, the future and, and learning from the past. Um, so, and what, what part of the article was looking at how we, how our cities have changed enormously, but we as people haven't changed much at all. We still die of the same things, still the same diseases, the same pandemics uh, still hit us. Uh, we might live longer because our healthcare is better, but we still feel the same. We still like the same spaces. We still have the same fears and ambitions um, as people. We haven't changed very much, but our technology, the way we travel and the way we live has changed enormously. So th this is the, uh, the previous drawing was the plan of Rome um, in the 18th, 18th century. Uh, and that this shows the kind of spaces we're familiar with. We were familiar with them 2000 years ago. Um, and these are intimate spaces that we feel comfortable in. Uh, this is uh, Cabusier's hand, and I think he was a fantastic architect, but I don't think he was a particularly good urban designer. These aren't places that we do feel comfortable in. Uh, they're designed for the motor car, and they're in the same way that Milton Keynes, I did my master's dissertation on Milton Keynes, and it's a very exciting place. But this was designed in the 70s. It was designed around the motor car, and it's not the way we would design a city now. So we have a very, we sort of, all, all the films, the science fiction, I'm not, I'm not a great science fiction fan, but I do like the imagery and looking at what the writers and the creators and the filmmakers think our cities are going to be like. We, most of them seem to paint a kind of dystopian future, but at Western Williamson, we have what we call a Friday ideas where we look at ideas to improve the city. And we think that the city of the future using technology uh, using looking at modern construction techniques, future construction techniques, and future technology, where the city is actually going to be a green and pleasant space. So we've been looking at this model city of 2.5 kilometer diameter with a high speed station in the middle of it. Um, and it could be on the route between Delhi and Mumbai. It could be on the route between Singapore and Malaysia, or it could be just outside of uh, Birmingham before it forks off to Leeds and Manchester. It would be different depending on where it, it is, but it in, in every situation, there's a high-speed station at the heart of the city and there's no personal transportation anywhere within that 2.5 kilometer diameter. Um, and trying to, so we're, this is something we're working on, trying to envisage how it would be zoned, the tightness of the spaces, where the uh, electric buses or hydrogen buses would, would run and how, how it would all be connected. Um, as a way of using the technology that is emerging. In the same way, 
this is looking at building technology. So we've been working with a company called Tyson Crook, who have developed a lift that moves horizontally as well as vertically and looking at how that would shape the city. So uh, with the kind of work that we're doing, we're looking at how you could get out, get up, get up at the bottom of the image, get out of the uh, underground system and basically go to any of the towers that you, you want to go into. So a, a building could free up the floor space, the public space, give the space over the urban realm open to the public and then have the reception area on the floors five to nine, say, and then have three towers, one for a hotel, one for office, one for housing, or could be a mixture of three. But it, but it, you, you can start to develop just as Manhattan and Chicago grew out of lift technology. Uh, you can Once those new technologies emerge, you can see how they can influence the forms and the shapes of the buildings and the forms and the shapes of the city. Um, and we looked at, at, at this on a, on a real site in Hong Kong for, for an ideas competition and then incorporated some of those ideas into our pitch for the Singapore high speed rail competition, looking at the high speed and the way that it knits into local transport, metro and buses, but also commercial development as well. And on a more, on a more modest scale, thinking about the last mile, thinking about how the, how the, the, the makeup of the city and the new technologies and how they're going to change uh, the way that we move around our cities. Um, so you've got electric bikes, electric scooters, quite modest uh, new technologies. Um, and if you Google future transport, nine times out of 10, the first thing that comes up is Hyperloop. And uh, Hyperloop's been around for, for years and years. It seems to be getting closer, but at the moment, it, it's although it's getting closer, it's still as, as, as far away as ever. We, we've been looking at how it might be used um, and the great attraction of Hyperloop is its energy efficiency and the, the effect it can have on, on climate change and sustainable development. So this was some of the big, busiest air routes in the world uh, in Australia. So we've been looking at creating a Hyperloop link between Adelaide and Brisbane, the, the, the major cities in the uh, southeast of, of Australia. So this would be a station outside of the Sydney Opera House. And this is a station next to Flinders Street Station in Melbourne. And looking at where, where, how these link together, one of the great things about Australia is uh, there's often nothing between the, the bigger cities. And there are, there are, this seems to be one of the great uses of, of, of that technology. But by the same token, the, what the pandemic is showing us is that if we are going to be able to work anywhere, speed isn't always necessary. So I've been lucky enough to work in Australia, had to travel there a lot. And I'm, I'm beginning to think that instead of getting there as quickly as possible, uh, it, uh, because you, however you get there, it's still 24 hours cooped up in a, in a tin box. To get there in three or four days in a more relaxed way, um, in the same way that the rush for high speed, if, as long as we're all connected and we can work wherever we are, the emphasis for speed might not be so great as it was. Uh, so if we put equal weight into the communications technology as we are doing into uh, transport technology, we might come up with a, with a different solution. And one of the other things that's come out of our Friday ideas 
is so that, again small scale uh, effects on the city looking at how we can make the city a more attractive place for uh, for uh, cyclists um, how we can give them technology give them information um, make sure we can be that the, we're connected the whole time and and safe as well um, and we've used some of these ideas in a proposal for Manhattan so I, I worked in New York in the 80s and going back again over various um, various um, events since um, I've always been unimpressed by how it relies on the car um, and it's not a very civilized place to walk around so we, we've looked at a scheme to completely pedestrianize the whole of Broadway, um, making shared surfaces using automated vehicles, electric vehicles, cycleways, and uh, public parks uh, going the whole length of Manhattan, um, which again is, we think the future of transport should be born out of what we want to do with our cities. So the emphasis shouldn't be on the technology, it should be on the kind of environments and the kind of cities we want to create. So that was Manhattan. Um, and this is Crouch End in North London. Again, post pandemic, how we can make our cities and our suburbs more attractive. So using shared surfaces and giving emphasis to pedestrians, so creating environments where the cars have to slow down for the pedestrians and not the pedestrians waiting for the car. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I did a future of transport seminar. And one of the one of the um, teacher, uh, one of the presenters was Paul Priestman, a fantastic industrial designer, and he was putting forward the view that the new technologies are being put forward by private companies uh, in very much the same way as the private companies developed the railways. So th these are inventions and proposals that are being put forward. Uh, we have to decide, decide as a society what kind of environment we want and how we're going to make these, these inventions, these proposals work for our cities. Um, there's such a lot of choice between the develop, in, in the developments that the private companies are putting forward, that it should be, it should be the, the people, this, the, the cities that are, being, that are deciding how these technologies are going to be used. Uh, one of the other speakers, was uh, Anthony Dewar from Network Rail. And he was putting forward the argument for learning from the past uh, to de design the future. So on the, on the right hand side of the slide, there's um, images from uh, science fiction films. But on the left hand side, a, a system which still existed into the early years of this century, which was uh, British Rail's motor rail system, where you used to be able to take your car on the train. And that could lead to a, a new way of transport, where you, you can envisage getting into one of Paul Priestman's vehicles, the previous slide, and that actually going on to the train for longer distances. So if you're going around at 20 miles an hour in the city to then just drive onto the train and go at hundred or the Hyperloop um, at, at several hundred miles an hour to Edinburgh, that's uh, one way that those technologies could link together. I think one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways that public transport is going to best uh, develop is looking at the, how it joins together. Uh, people like the convenience of their own car 
but if there was a if there was a good way of linking up the technologies uh, that wouldn't be as important so we, we've done a annual survey uh, which we started last year in 10 global cities and looking at the way that people travel in uh, 10 cities throughout the world and there's, a, there's a, some very interesting findings in that and we will build on that in subsequent years it'll be very interesting to see how the pandemic has changed that uh, as we do it this year and we've been looking at how people spend their money where, where how people choose to travel in different age groups and, and genders um, in different parts of the world and what different people think is is have their priorities we've also been looking at how we get people back to work how we can get that trust again back in the public transport system uh, at the moment nobody seems to have taken up my idea that you book your time on the underground so if you want to travel you book a time between half past seven and quarter to eight and you can be guaranteed that, that, that there isn't there aren't going to be crowds um it could actually be a really great way of, of travel and making the way making the the city a much more civilized city um and th there's so many things we can do if we think about how we're going to not go back to the previous way of doing it what this pandemic has shown us i think is how bad our transport system was and how divisive it was and we need to think about how we can improve that and actually learn uh, from the pandemic to make our city city more civilized and it, it can be done this is miami uh, the design district and for something like 10 blocks uh, there are no cars uh, you just get fantastic spaces it's not expensive, it's not exclusive, uh, but what it is, is just well thought out uh, in terms of materials, in terms of spaces, um, and quite easy to achieve if the political will is there to do it. Um, so as a, as a practice, we are passionate about the what we're doing about improving uh, cities through safe efficient well-designed public transport uh, simon sinek whose ted talks are fantastic he says that companies are not defined by what they do but by why they do it um, and we, we are very clear about why we do what we do and the kind of projects that we work on and it gives us a real focus as a studio uh, because it's all about uh, the future of the planet and our overriding concern as all architects has to be about sustainability and combating climate change thank you thank you very very much for that chris that was, that was genuinely fascinating um Got, uh, got a question in already from the Asif Din. Uh, for those who, by the way, get, take a while to formulate your questions, please do put them in the chat and I'll read them out again if you're feeling confident and unmute yourself. Um, anyway, I'll read Asif's question. Could, uh, could Chris, could you talk about the economic critical mass and weighting bottlenecks, particularly in relation to high speed rail and horizontal lifts? This is also in relation to the ground plane and the separation of pedestrians and transportation traffic. Um, on the lifts, uh, one, of, one of the great things about the lifts is because they can move out of the way and they're programmed, they are very efficient in energy terms so you, and, and in space terms, so you can have several lifts in the same shafts because they can move away, move out of the way depending on where they're travelling to. Um, Again, the technology is in its infancy, and but the, the, it seems like a really good uh, improvement 
And I, th I think one of the one of the dangers is for, for people like me is I get I get enthusiastic about the technology uh, rather than how how it's used. Uh, so I think what I'm gradually coming to realize is we have to think what problems we need to solve um, and use the technology to solve them. So th those kinds of lifts will become popular if there's a reason for them. That we, 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 I guess all those years I was watching Tomorrow's World looking at great inventions and thinking, well, why haven't they happened? They, they only happen when there's a need for them. So, and what this pandemic has done probably is to, we've all moved forward five years probably mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the past six months uh, because there's now a need for, for those technologies. So that, that will lead to other changes. Um, the, the first part of the question was about road priorities or- uh, Economic critical mass and waiting bottlenecks in relation to high-speed rail and horizontal list. Uh, this is in relation to the ground plane and the separation of pedestrians and transportation traffic. Yeah, um, so in, in the future, the, the, um, the, I, I think what, what's making London a more civilised city and why other cities around the world are looking at London is because of the traffic calming measures that we've done. We are prioritizing the pedestrian art, the pedestrian and penalizing the car. Uh, there's a fantastic image which Jan Gale uses a lot, where rather than the roads joining up at junctions, is the, the pavement continues and the car has to go over the pavement. Uh, if I could achieve one thing in my lifetime as, a, as an urban designer and an architect, it would be that one thing that the pedestrians have priority over the car and the car has to wait for the pedestrian to cross the road, the pavement, use the pavement the whole time. So I, th I think we are doing things to get better, but the, you know, the, there is still vehicle movement it is so wasteful uh, compared with giving priority to the pedestrian, both in terms of the, the effect on the city and people's perceptions of the priorities. Mm -hmm. I've got another question from um, Alastair, uh, who asks, what lessons do we have to learn from the way China has developed its built environment over the past 30 years? Um, I, I, I worked in China quite a lot about 10, 15 years ago. And at that time, they were inviting us to do a lot of the conceptual work around the high speed stations. Um, the great thing about the Chinese is they learn incredibly quickly. And after, after doing that for about two or three years, they didn't need us anymore. They learned exactly what we did and did it for themselves. Uh, but I think that they, 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 so I, I think like a lot, a lot of countries that are trying to change the way that they, they, they do things, there's, they've made huge mistakes as, as we did uh, in, when we were becoming an industrial nation. And uh, they've made terrible mistakes in terms of sustainability, but they have learned pretty quickly. And I think we can learn a lot from them now as well. Uh, they've got great experience of high-speed mm -hmm. uh, trains. Uh, their cities are getting more livable. Uh, they haven't yet, uh, they're still not paying too much attention to conservation in a lot of the urban environments. Um, to my mind, a better model is Singapore, who seem to be very sensitive to public participation, uh, planning in a very centralized way but being quite democratic about the kind of uh, communities that they're creating. 
Sure. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I've got another question from Sam who asks, there are so many scales of design with regards to transport design from the micro scale of product design of services, particularly on the bridge, all the way through to city-wide scale of transport oriented development. How do you tie together the varying scales which make up a transport scheme so each reads coherently with one another? And how does Western Williamson approach working between these scales of design in the office? Um, great question. I think, so we've been doing quite a lot of work with Network Rail recently, who are re-establishing their design philosophy. And they, they obviously in the Victorian area, they, they had a great uh, British engineering and architectural expertise in the transport. When Brunel designed Paddington Station, he designed it in a way that was going to be a work of beauty and, and then throughout the 60s British Rail did the same they had a great design department and they're trying to get back to that so we've been doing quite a lot of work with them in their design standards and looking at the way that they future proof their stations and what kind of stations what the community want from their stations and all those romantic images of Bernard Cribbins and the railway children and how you can build on the best of that mm. going forward. And one of the things we've been trying to talk about is integrated transport so that, I mean, I, I, I would love to do this and one of your participants might do it, is develop an app which gets you door to door uh, so I, you know, if you go anywhere in 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 England, uh, say to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, you know you've got to take the train to. Can't remember where it is now, but uh, wait, wait, can't remember where it is. But it, uh, you take the train, but you've got no idea when you get there. You know, you have to do a lot of research. So it would be great to be able to. And the same with coming to London, to be able to know where you pick an electronic electric bike up or an electric scooter or an automated vehicle in the future, or how, you, how are you going to integrate your transport? And that nobody seems to be doing that at the moment. But obviously, in the future, uh, technology companies will do all of that, uh, hopefully, for you. And so they will, they will make it easy. Uh, for you to travel at the moment, it's it's not. Yeah, I think I think uh, City Mapper tried doing it, didn't they? They kind of there was an app where they told you where to sit on the train to get off at this station. Yeah, and they did kind of integrate. Oh well, you might want to get an Uber from here, and this is how much that will cost you. Um, yeah. But like as a avid cyclist myself, it's really frustrating to see like you know what, if you just tell me that I could get cycle to a train station, and then get on a train and then cycle after that train station that makes my life way easier but that always just takes that kind of inherent knowledge of london knowing that i can take a train a bike on this train and it will take me here at that pace or whatever yeah, um, yeah. it's not made easy no i've got another question for, from sam uh, who says thank you for the talk by the way um and sam is a student at the lsa and he says our design think tank this year was looking at the future of walking and cycling uh, in the city and achieving this at the scale of london Hackney and Dalston. Where do you think the future of transport is headed in London? Big question. Uh, will London be a walking and cycling city over the next century or will, at all, or, will, or will autonomous vehicles rapidly increase the number of cars on the road and retain the existing problems that cars cause the city? Um, yeah, automated vehicles aren't the answer. Uh, to congestion and to creating a, a more civilized cities, pedestrians and cyclists are. So I, I think, again, giving people choice of uh, having, having, having availability. So if you don't want to bring your own bike into the city or go from different parts of the city to have more bike sharing schemes, again, having an app which you can use for all of these myriad of different systems mm. would help. Um, making it easy for people to, to make those choices. But I, th I think, I mean, I've, I've loved 
riding around uh, as the city has been quieter and uh, people would be much more appreciative. London is a fantastic place to cycle and walk around. Mm. Um, you've got to do something about the cars in the first place. And, and uh, you know, just as you could see a lot of progress being made, it will be interested to see uh, if we can get people's confidence back to using public transport again. And, and uh, But then by the same token, there might be less people traveling. Most architects I know are talking about working from home two days a week going mm -hmm. forward. So there's only going to be three fifths, even if we did all travel at the same time, three fifths of people uh, traveling. So I, I think we will learn a lot from this uh, pandemic, but it, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Sure, I think if anything, like the pandemic has taught us about what, why we should, why we should travel. You know, a lecture such as this, or you know, the LSA hosted lectures last year where people uh, zoomed in from four continents, right? And maybe we don't need to fly for such things. And I think the highlight it's highlighted the, the the reasons why we travel, primarily yeah. to be in contact with other people. Um, I've got another question from Margit, more well, Margit. Apologies if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, they, and it's about the cost of travel um, and they ask and they say like even less wealthy people can afford a second car or even a first car and you know currently train tickets are very expensive how can we ensure that any future vision for the transport for transport remains just and truly public and socially inclusive yeah that is a very interesting mm. uh, salient point because you know, people, Google and Amazon, uh, they, they aren't great, they aren't very demogra democratic organizations. They, they, we have to make it affordable for everybody. Um, and again, if we can make this, so I, part of this research that I've been doing for how the railways um, affected London, the growth of London. Uh, the, the majority of people in the 19th century, there's 250,000 people walked for about an hour to get to where they needed to work. And, you know, if you can make the city more civilised and encourage people to walk, uh, that that seems to be the, the best way forward. Uh, but I mean, one one of the naive things I've always I've always thought that Crossrail would make uh, would would get give people more choice of where to live and work, um, and it does. But it is also expensive, and the, the it's a political dilemma as well. We, we, whenever you pick up a newspaper in Malaysia or Singapore, you're bombarded with adverts for developments to buy in places like Canning Town and Custom House because they're close to Crossrail stations. Mm -hmm. So we're inflating prices in, in further away. So rather than making allowing allowing greater choice of where to live and work, we're actually inflating the prices of houses. That that's a political uh, problem. Sure. Uh, but there, there, again, there's a lot we can do about it. I think that's kind of always been the case with transport. You know, when you look at development of the London Underground. Um, I was wondering, with regards to that, you, you mentioned Woolwich and Barclay Homes. Um, I was wondering how that relationship looked like, as in, did they approach you? Did you approach them? Did you uh, engage with maybe the architects or other practices that would be developing the housing within that area? And what, uh, and, and how you eventually then pitch that um, to the authorities? Um, it's always complicated. Everything is, everybody has their own client. So we, our client, it was originally Barclay Homes that approached us and said, mm -hmm. look, we want to design this station and take it to Crossrail to, to try and get approval for it in much the same way that Canary Wharf did their Crossrail station. 
So they, they knew they wanted a Crossrail station there, so they designed it and then they took it to Crossrail and Crossrail eventually took it over. And so Barclay Homes made the initial running for it, commissioning us to design it um, and the engineers. And then we worked alongside, uh, Allies and Morrison were doing the master plan and uh, Lifshultz Davidson were doing the housing to the, to, uh, around the stations. And we worked on it together of, uh, the, to, to look at looking at how the master plan grew as a result of that increased infrastructure provision. Interesting, thank you. Um, got, you you've, you've kind of um, answered this already, but I presume yeah, the, uh, this person who's named user one uh, may or may not have heard, but I'll, I'll read it out. I said, since the start of the pandemic, the use of public transport has fallen dramatically in part because of the transmission of the virus. Have you introduced any new measures or materials into the design that could allow users to keep traveling safely in any future pandemic? Um, not in terms of materials, but in that concept board that we yeah. did. So we, we did one, we did one, how, it, how the people's concerns about the pandemic would affect the workplace and another one as to how it would, how we could do better. And what, what spurred that on is that at the end of the last lockdown, whenever it was May, June, uh, Boris basically said, uh, you know, please go back to work and, you know, jump in your cars and go back to work. And that, uh, rather than this is what we're going to do to make public transport safer and better and more civilised. Because, I mean, what, I personally will never go on the underground again without a mask. And I will probably, I will try and not travel at rush hour you know you, you, when you consider how uncivilized it was it makes you real you know why we were mad the way we used to live uh, so we need to try and avoid that so that all, a, lot, a lot of those ideas were how you could time your you know you, you you'd make it cheaper for people to travel earlier and you'd if you book a book, a, you know, so you can incentivize people to book times, and you can also make it more attractive. You can have entertainers, you can have people helping, more people cleaning as well, and more. It would actually be fun to travel on the underground mm -hmm. uh, and on the bus system. If you, if you, if we spent some of the money that we're spending to try and get people using public transport again and then getting people out of their cars um, and then, you know so but it, ta it takes a lot of doing and at the moment that I don't think there were many people at Transport for London looking at that approach. Yeah I think I mean that also comes down to kind of society's chronological structure and that work starts at nine finishes at five and offices are usually in the centre so people are you know there's a reason why people are traveling to the same place at the same time and that's Another like symptom, I think, of it as well. Uh, got another question from Margaret. Uh, any infrastructure, firstly, is a large invest investment money, embodied carbon, creativity, and other forms of energy. Often trees and landscapes have to be cut with the future benefit yet to be proven. The return will take many, many years or sometimes will never come. How do you go about evaluating when and what kind of infrastructure is worth realising? Uh, that is a, a, a brilliant question. I mean, mm -hmm. so one, one of my best friends is Roger Harabin, who's the environment correspondent at Radio 4, and he he had somebody on his one of his reports saying uh, high speed two calls itself an environment, you know, sustainable project, but it's going to be 2050 before all the concrete and steel that's embodied in the pro, uh, project is going to make it carbon neutral. I mean, but if you, and I, I, and I thought, yeah, that's true. It, they are, we, we do use a lot of concrete. We do lose, use a lot of materials. But when I look at the infrastructure that the Victorians have provided, 
and we're still using it 200 years later, they had the same concerns. And that this, the infrastructure that we're building isn't going to last 50 years, it's going to last centuries. And, you know, if we want to um, grow uh, both intellectually and materialistically, we, we want to, you know, we either stop what we're doing, uh, which a lot of people probably think we should and could, or if we want to develop, how do we develop in a civilized way and actually make our, leave the world a better place uh, than we found it? So I think there is a, a way forward and it's right always to have those concerns. Um, and I know there are, there are a lot of people, friends of mine that protest against HS2 and they, you know, they do have valid concerns, but these are things that have been debated in parliament, just as the same way as they were in the Victorian era. Uh, there were in, in 1846, there were 272 acts of parliament uh, to develop railways. That is fascinating, actually. Thank you for that. Um, I realise it's one minute past two, which means we run over an hour, an hour, hour uh, slot. But I just want to say thank you for everyone for the questions and for being part of this. Uh, thank you particularly, of course, to Chris for your time and for this fascinating talk on uh, civilised cities and the future of mobility. Um, we do have a CPD next week for those who would like to join, so do stay tuned. Uh, we have more being announced for April, May, June and July, of course, as well. So again, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you. Bye.